Hi guys, welcome back to my YouTube channel. I am here with an educational video after very very long. And in this video, I'm going to be discussing one topic that is by far my favorite out of everything in first year, which is language comprehension and speech production. I'm going to be using very simple words and I'll try to explain it to you in the simplest way possible so that anyone ranging from grade 9 till MBBS can understand this. It's a fun topic, so if you're interested, then do watch this video. So I've broken down the subtopics that I'll be speaking about today, right? The first one is the functional areas of the brain. So before we start about how our brain processes stuff, let us see which parts of the brain process language. This is a very, very rudimentary brain I've drawn here, but our actual brain isn't like this, guys, okay? The most important thing here is this line, which is known as the lateral sulcus. So our brain isn't smooth, you know that, right? So it has a lot of sulci and gyri, which is depressions and elevations. So the depressions in the brain are known as the sulci. And the most prominent one is the central sulcus over here. And the other one is the lateral sulcus. So this lateral sulcus, on either side of it, you have two important speech and language areas. This one is the Broca's motor area and this one is the vernix area which is the sensory area. And now let me talk a little bit about these areas too. So this 22 that you're seeing is basically the secondary auditory cortex. And the 17, 18, 19 that you're seeing is basically the visual association areas. Now this is the central sulcus, right? So in front of the central sulcus, so this is the front of the brain and this is posterior, so this anterior, posterior. So in front of the central sulcus, this area is the primary motor cortex and this area is the primary sensory cortex. So any kind of motor functions, they leave from the primary motor cortex into the spinal cord and the lower half of the body. And all the sensations that arrive finally converge into this primary sensory area. So let us now talk about how all these areas integrate together to, form, uh, to perform functions of speech and language. Also just don't get confused by the numbers here. You really don't have to remember them at this stage. They're only for easier understanding. So there's this person known as Broadman who gave in specific numbers to specific regions of the brain based on their functions. And that is why you have these numbers. Now, when we talk about the functions of these areas, let us go with two different pathways trying to explain this. First is the auditory pathway and the second is the visual pathway. Starting with the auditory pathway, let us see how we repeat a word that we hear. Suppose someone has told me a word or a sentence like, Hi, my name is Rahul. How am I going to repeat the same sentence? So, there are two auditory pathways, ventral, which is anterior, and dorsal. The ventral pathway tells you what the auditory message is, and the dorsal pathway tells you from where the message is coming. So, through the auditory nerves, which is the vestibular cochlear nerve, the auditory impulses, they go through several stages of the brainstem and finally converge both into the thalamus and into the cortex of the cerebrum. This is just the cerebrum that we're seeing. So in the cerebrum, they converge into this tiny area which is on the inside of the lateral sulcus, which is area 41 and 42. So area 41 and 42 interpret what is being heard and from where that particular message is being heard. But we still cannot understand the message or the words that are being heard. We just know that it's a word and we listen to the syllables, the tone, pitch and frequency of the particular sentence is interpreted in area number 41 and 42. Next, that signals go to area number 22. In area number 22, we associate the words that we heard with our memory, with our previous memory and try to make some kind of meaning of it. Basically, area number 22 is the one that tells you that what you're hearing are words and not just some kind of gibberish. Now, very closely associated with area number 22 is this, the vernix area, right? So, vernix area 
is the one that interprets the meaning out of the words that we've heard. For example, 41 and 42 have interpreted the pitch, frequency and duration or basically the kind of words that we've heard. Area number 22 tells us that what we've heard are words and tries to associate it with our previous memory. And finally, the signals go to vernix area, which try to tell us the meaning of the word that we've heard. We interpret what's going on. Someone has told me, hi, my name is Rahul. So vernix area is basically interpreting the fact that there is someone and he is named Rahul. And vernix area has also realized that we're supposed to repeat this sentence. So from the vernix area, you have a set of nerve fibers going to Broca's area. And these nerve fibers are together called arcuate fasciculus. So, these are association fibers which are present throughout the brain which link different areas of the brain. So, these ar this arcuate fasciculus links the Wernick's area to the Broca's area. So, the signals or basically the interpreted signals that you're supposed to repeat this word is sent to the Broca's motor area. The Broca's motor area, it is responsible for word formation. It just has signals from the Wernix area that something is to be repeated. But Broca's area is the one that forms the particular words, the words that are, hi, my name is Rahul. All these words or basically word formation is taking place at Broca's motor area after which the signals go to the premotor cortex. So this is motor cortex right and whatever is in front of it is obviously premotor cortex. Okay I'm going to show you this one figure. This is called a motor homunculus and the function of this premotor cortex and motor cortex is to excite the specific muscles responsible for production of speech. Just think about it, for speech, not only do you need your tongue, you need teeth, you need your jaw, you need larynx for breathing. So all these muscles, it's a very specific activity. All these muscles are sequentially activated by the premotor cortex and motor cortex when it receives the signals from Broca's area as to which word is to be spoken. If you see this motor homunculus, the biggest space here is given for vocalization, that means the most precise activity or the most controlled activity by our motor cortex is speaking or vocalization. Now the visual pathway is somewhat similar except for the starting steps. We're going to assume this is our eye, right? And we're looking at a book. Our eye is perceiving the image of these words. This image is sent via a long pathway to the primary visual cortex and the secondary visual cortex. 17 number is the primary visual cortex. The basic function of primary visual cortex is to get the image of what we are seeing. The signals of which are then sent to the secondary visual cortex. It has the same function as secondary auditory cortex which is basically comparing it with our previous memory and trying to figure out if we already have seen this image or trying to jot down a new memory of the particular image that we're seeing. Now, from secondary visual cortex, the signals are, are going to the angular gyrus. The angular gyrus realizes that what we're seeing are words and it tells us the meaning of these words. And now from the angular gyrus, which is 39, the message again goes to vernix area and now the vernix area tells us the exact thought behind these words suppose we're reading a sentence that says this is the best place on earth now the visual association area has realized that this is a particular sentence that's being read and the angular gyrus is basically nothing but a little voice in our head you know when we read something without saying it out loud that small voice in your head that reads it in your head, that's basically angular gyrus. And this angular gyrus is sending the signals to Wernick's area to interpret what the sentence is saying. This is the best place in the world. That means that whatever place is there is supposedly the best place in the world. And this signal is now sent to the Broca's area again for repetition. Now I'm just taking an example of repetition, but it can also be just speaking out or responding. Suppose you just read this is the best place in the world and you're supposed to 
respond by saying true or false. The thought is interpreted in the vernix area, all kind of calculations, interpretations, memory, language, all those cognitive functions are performed in the vernix area, after which the signals are sent to the Broca's motor area. And the Broca's motor area undergoes the same pathway to say out whatever response or whatever repetition of the particular words that is seeked by the reader, by the listener. And now let us talk about lesions in this area. So there can be a lot of things like stroke, trauma or any kind of injury to the brain that can cause lesion of this area which is basically this area becoming non-functional. So what happens when these particular areas become non-functional? Let us look at a group of diseases which are known as aphasias. And to learn aphasias, let us ask each other a few questions, right? Suppose someone is speaking, the first thing you notice is, is the speech fluent? If the answer is yes or the answer is no. Mostly the speech is not fluent in motor area lesion or mostly Broca's area lesion. But if it's fluent, there can be more types to it. The second question you have to ask is, can the person comprehend whatever is being spoken or written? If your answer is yes or no. If the person is fluent and not able to comprehend what is being spoken, then you ask one last question. Can the person repeat the particular sentence? If the answer is no, he has vernix aphasia. And now if the answer for he is able to comprehend the message is yes, then this person has anomic aphasia. Now anomic aphasia is the most mild type of aphasia in which the person really can't find the word for something. That is why he is able to understand what the thought is but he just can't find the word for it. The lesion is in the vernix area. The, so the speech for this person is going to be something like this. Imagine when you try to keep pressing the middle uh, option when you're trying to type something like this. This is how that person's speech is going to sound like. And now let's see if his speech is not fluent. Can he comprehend the message yes or no? So if he can comprehend that particular message, then there's obviously no lesion in the vernix area. But since he's not fluent in his speech, there is a lesion in Broca's area. So this is Broca's aphasia. And now if he's not fluent and is not able to comprehend the message, he has something known as global aphasia. Now global aphasia is wherein both vernix and Broca's area are affected. Now for Broca's area the speech is very stuttery. For example this. The person really can't form words to express his thought. He understands that particular thought. He is not fluent in expressing it and that is why you have Broca's area's lesion. But when he is not able to understand anything yet his speech is fluent then he definitely has vernix aphasia because it's responsible for comprehending a thought and Broca is responsible for word formation. And this was about it for today's class or lecture or video. Um, thank you so much for watching. Also do let me know any suggestions you have for any kind of videos because I am kind of free for the next one or two months and I think I'll be able to make as much as content as you want. So yes, thank you so much for watching. I'll keep you guys updated. Bye. Bye.